All right, so I wanted to talk to you today about my one of my favorite theorems. It is known as the squeeze theorem. So, um, but we're going to just start with a popular guessing game, like how many Jolly Ranchers are in a jar. So, um, to help us do this, I have actually made a jar full of Jolly Ranchers. It's coming up right here. So here it is. See, there's all the Jolly Ranchers in it. It does go all the way up to the top. I know you can't tell from this angle. But it is full. And I'm going to turn it upside down so you can kind of see what's it going on. Maybe sideways. Okay, so that's a jar full of Jolly Ranchers. It's very short. I don't know if you can tell that. It's a very short jar. It is not tall. It's squat. Okay. It's usually easier to do these things when you can actually handle the jar and take a look and see what's going on. But there you go. There's my jar. All right, so what I want you to do is on your paper or on your notes, make a guess about how many Jolly Ranchers are in this jar by giving us one that's way too high and one that's way too low. So if you could do that really fast for me, just make a guess, way too high and way too low. I'm gonna say a thousand is too high and too low is two. Now we know the answer is somewhere in there, right? And as you talk to each other or you talk, you look around and you find some other people who've made some choices, you can actually narrow in what's going on. Um, so I went way too high and way too low, but you might go too low is 20. Because it looks like there's more than 20 in here. And, and I actually didn't count. Normally I count. So go ahead and make some predictions. Decide what you think. We will talk about this when we are together and figure out how many Jolly Ranchers in the jar and I'll actually count the same exact number because I didn't bother. Um, so, um, so we can investigate some complicated limits by doing this kind of guessing. So we cannot evaluate this. We've got what the sign of an undefined function times zero. It's just confusing. Um, but what could we, what do we know about sign? Sine of X is sandwiched between what two values? Sine of X is sandwiched between negative one and positive one. We know that it is a sandwich function. It That's what sine does. It just bounces back and forth between negative one and positive one. And so what about this is the range or the output of one over sine of x changed. Let's go ahead and take a look at one over sine of x. Um, not that one. Um, one over sine of x. I mean sine of one over x, excuse me. So you got this weird thing, but if we look at it, it's still bouncing between negative one and positive one, but you can see how the limit at zero is very confusing, but it is bouncing between negative one and positive one. So the range has not changed. So it's still negative one and positive one. What would have happened if we applied a vertical stretch or shrink has the range changed? So if we stuck a number in front, has it changed? So, because we do have a number in front, our number is a little bit funky, but let's go ahead and look. So if I stick a three in front, oh, definitely. It went up to three. If I stick a one half in front, I think that was the other one. Okay, it shrunk down to one half. So let's go ahead and take a look here in our work. So this became negative three and positive three. This became negative one half and positive one half. So no matter what this is, it's negative K and positive K. That's what they're trying to get at there. Using the answers, what's gonna happen to this? Now, it's gonna be set between two functions instead of two numbers. So think about that for just a minute. So it will be negative x squared and positive x squared following the thoughts from before. Okay. Now we can start talking about limits. What is the limit as we go up to negative x squared? So if we think about negative x squared, negative x squared looks like this. And it goes to zero, and that number is zero, right? As you 
approach the lower bound, the lower bound is going to be zero. And if we approach our upper bound, what is the limit? As we, so the, remember we're approaching zero. So as I approach zero, this is zero. Limit as x approaches zero. Let's have some issues. Limit as x approaches zero. And this one looks like this, but as x approaches zero, I'm still getting zero. And so what is the limit? The limit must be zero then. Because it has to be sandwiched between two numbers. And so that whole idea of the guessing game is that we bounce back and forth. We make those guesses. If I said, pick an, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100, what would be your first guess? Um, and I would give the either higher or lower, and we were live, we would do that. Um, that kind of idea is we force that sandwich, which is a very cool thought. Because then, when something's really complicated, we can use this. This is known as a squeeze theorem. So we're talking about the squeeze theorem. Here are our topics. Go ahead and pause the video and re record this. I'm going to go ahead and just keep talk, talk over it real fast. If you don't want to listen to me, you might want to pause. But that idea is that I'll be messing with you a little bit here. Conditions. F, G, and H of X have to be continuous. So um, that's really important. It has to be continuous functions. And so contain and... G is the smallest, F's in the middle, and H is the biggest, okay? So when we think about what we just did with the other one, we have the sine of X in the middle, okay? Because it would be our smallest. Actually, we had this in the middle. Excuse me, that in the middle. And then we had X squared, negative X squared, which is always less than or equal to, always less than or equal to zero. And we had x squared up here, which is always greater than or equal to zero. And so that interval is that idea is that those are surrounding it and squishing it at all times. They're always one on top and always one on bottom. So then the limit as x approaches g is equal to the limit as x, as x approaches a of g of x, which is equal to the limit of it. If those limits are equal, which they were on our last problem, See, they were equal. They were both the same. They were both zero. On both of them, I was approaching zero. And so since those were equal, the, the sandwich function has to have the same value. So that's what we're saying. But you would say the squeeze theorem. And you don't need to use the word squeeze theorem. Squeeze theorem, I think, is one of the easiest theorems to remember its name because we're squeezing something in. And so it's easiest to remember its name. But the idea is that this. Now, whenever you're going to use the squeeze theorem, you must verify both conditions are true, that they are continuous, the functions are all continuous, and the functions sandwich the other function. So I want to just show you on a piece of graph paper, on, on our graph, on Desmos with our previous function, that they are being sandwiched. Okay, so if you see right here, Zoom in way into there. See how you can see how it's totally approaching zero, which we wouldn't necessarily have. But we know that negative x squared and positive x squared are, see how they're all around it everywhere? And so that's why it's being sandwiched or squozen in at the middle. And the limits of the other two force the limit of the third, of the one in the middle. Does that make sense? So I think that this visual is probably the most helpful there of any I can give you of what's happening. So that's squeeze. So they verify the conditions. The first one, they're continuous functions. The This is true the whole time. That one function is smaller, one function is bigger, and the other function is always in the middle. That's always sandwiched. So it's like an ice cream sandwich. You don't want that ice cream to slide out. It has to always, always have the cookies on top. Okay. We evaluate the limits of the up, the surrounding functions. If they're the same, then we can make a conclusion. If they are different, we cannot. Okay. So they have to be the same. Okay. All right. Moving on. So for checking our understanding, we've got the, on the interval with these three functions. We want to decide, decide which one goes where. So we've got x and x squared and the natural log of x. So which one is the sandwich? Well, x squared is the biggest. 
I know that. Hmm. Which one is the smallest? And try to do it without looking at a graph. Um, it's easier to tell if you look at a graph, but we know that x is just a straight line. It goes like this for the origin. And then that, so we've got x is a straight line. So I can do this with my brain rather than decimals. And the natural log of x does this. Oh, I'm going to go ln smaller. Okay. For zik between 0 and pi fourths, find the function with values sandwiched between sine and cosine. So we need to kind of think of a third function between 0 and pi fourths sandwiched. So I'm just going to go and look at my graph again and let's set my window the x axis between 0 and pi fourths. I'm going to count, um, I don't care how I count, that part's not important. Sine of x, oops, I missed the end. Cosine x. Um, let's change our output. We'll go from negative 1 to positive 1. Okay. So here's what it looks like. We went to pi fourths because that's where they meet. Okay, so they meet at pi fourths. They're the same. So what might always be stuck between them? There's lots of different right answers. We'll come up with one. Let... All right. Oh, shoot. I didn't read this on the interval from zero to one. Because when I'm squaring fractions, they're smaller than home, the, their counterparts. It helps if you read it. Anyway. Um, so. If x is, so we've got k of x here and m of x, and f fits in between them. Explain why the squeeze theorem can't be used to find the limit. So let's go ahead and just try to find the limit of k. So the limit as x approaches 1, negative 1, of f of, of k of x. So basically they're telling us this. We already know they're both continuous functions. They're both parabolas. Of course they're continuous. And... Um, let's see what's going on. So k of x will be negative 1 squared, negative 1 squared minus 2 times negative 1 plus 3, which is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3, which is equal to 6. And then we have the limit as x approaches negative 1 of m of x, which is 1 half times negative 1. squared plus negative 1 plus 13 over 2, which is equal to 1 half minus 1 plus 13 over 2, which is equal to 12 over 2, because these are going to combine to a negative 1 half, which is equal to 6. So they, the limits are both the same. So what's the problem? So that's what I was expecting to be wrong. But the limits didn't agree. Did I do bad math? Oh. Oh. Negative sign on the outside. And so now I get four. Okay. The limits don't agree. Excuse me for my bad mathematics. I'm missing that sign. 
the limits do not agree and therefore we can't use the Sproul's theorem. That's what I was expecting to happen and it wasn't working. All right, they're given um, by the limit. So notice that the limits, the values at one are both identical. We can see that um, we are told the K is sandwiched in between them. So what we would say is something like this. The we notice the conditions. These are continuous functions. And K is sandwiched in between those functions at all times, because those are our two most important conditions. And then we'll say the limit as X approaches one of F of X equals the limit as X approaches one of V of X equals, and they both equal 11. And therefore, the limit as x approaches 1 of k of x equals 11. And I'll explain my reasoning. So, both continuous functions. So, f x g of x. I restate this, but I'm not going to rewrite it, and the limits agree. The limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x, and therefore the limit. Therefore. So explaining your reasoning can get a little bit complicated. You need to say all those things. You need to write them all down when it asks for an explanation or a justification. So that's the squeeze theorem. Um, we'll have a conversation in class. Have a great day.